Welcome, it's a nice day, it's a beautiful day. Uh, I'm gonna have my mask off because I know some people like to read lips, um, but uh, feel free to keep your masks on if you want. This is, uh, this is not gonna be a happy jump up and down when you're done leaving, singing songs and stuff kind of a talk, okay? So I just wanna prepare you. Uh, I've been doing archeology span in Lake County since 1971. That's 50 years. Uh, those of you who don't know me, I'm the guy that got the state to buy Anderson Marsh as a state park to preserve 38 uh, Native American cultural sites within that park area. Uh, I've been working all of these years to preserve and interpret what I can of the traditional um, Native American culture and the cultural sites that have been here literally for at least 20,000 years. We have um, over at Elim in the Oaks Arm of the Lake back in 2006, we recovered a chipped obsidian knife made out of Napa obsidian and that was dated to 21,000 years old. We have the oldest spear points in North America, 14,500 years old. So this is really an amazing place when it comes to Native American culture and Native American history. What I'm gonna talk about today is uh, not a very good episode in, uh, in history of the area. Um, and I came about doing this research because I had spent several years working with the local tribes, the local people, getting to know the culture, and every time I came across something about the Bloody Island Massacre, it seemed like it was described this way, and then it was described that way, and it was described this way, and I wanted to find out for myself as much as I could about it so that I would have a better understanding of the history that the Native American community had gone through, as well as the ranching community that was here. Um, when I started digging through the published uh, and unpublished references, I, it was like opening a can of worms. I, there were, I discovered a massacre that happened years before the Bloody Island Massacre that most people aren't even aware of. Uh, I'll be talking about that. I'm, this talk, I'm gonna start with the Kelsey brothers in Missouri and what they were doing back there, how they came out here, what was going on here at the time with the Native American culture, what was going on here at the time uh, with, uh, with the Mexicans. This was part of Mexico at the time and, uh, and, and bring us all the way up uh, to the 1950s actually. So I will be going off on tangents I'll be talking for maybe an hour, maybe more. Just kind of depends. Um, and uh, we can have questions at the end if you'd like. Um, so, yeah. I'm an archaeologist. I like to deal with facts. If it's on the ground and in the ground, that's a fact. Um, anyway, I like to deal with facts. That's what scientists do. And when I read history, I always try to keep in mind that it's someone's story. It's not what actually happened. It's what somebody thinks happened and they wrote down what their perspective was of what happened based on their own biases and their own background. So I like to use the word his story. So it's, history is not what actually happened. Keep that in mind. History is his story of what happened. Get her story. And yeah, okay, whatever. <laughs> Herstory <laughs> is not a word in the dictionary, but um, so in my 40 years of research, 50 now actually, uh, I've never seen as many different versions of a story as what I'm about to show you during this talk. Don't kill the messenger, okay? I'm only repeating what others have written. This is a list of the references that I used. The ones that are in yellow are researchers' accounts of what happened. The ones in blue are pioneer accounts of what happened. The ones in white are Native American accounts of what happened. 
We're going to go through all of them. But we're going to start in Missouri and Kentucky. Sam and Susan Kelsey gave birth to Andrew Kelsey in 1821. He had two brothers, Benjamin and Sam, and they moved to Missouri. David was born in the 1930s. Ben, Sam, Andrew Kelsey illegally were trying to secure preemption to land claims of their neighbors in Hoffman Bend, Missouri. Now, back in those days, there was this uh, squatter's rights kind of legislation. If you squatted on somebody's land, after enough time, you could actually apply to get the patent for that land. That's what these guys were doing. People already had this land. They were going on their property squatting and then trying to get it away from them. Anyway, they were invited to leave, so they moved upriver. Sam Kelsey, was indicted for assault with intent to kill by the state of Missouri. After defaulting on his first court date, he later appeared and moved to squash the indictment, and the court agreed. Andrew Kelsey and Charles Beale were sued for trying to secure preemptive land rights of their neighbors in Henry County, Missouri. <clears throat> so you see a pattern. Let me back that up. Meanwhile, in Lake County, the 10 Native American communities and political centers around the lake were busy living as they had for several thousand years. Their shell bead, money economy, fowling, hunting, grain, and acorn processing were serving them well. I know exactly how you feel. <laughs> Mexico won its independence from Spain in 1822, and Mariano Vallejo was made the commander of Mexico's northern frontier. He immediately makes all Native Americans his subjects. He was the commandant of the San Francisco Presidio and was told by the Mexican governor to move his garrison to Sonoma. Mariano and his brother Salvador moved to Sonoma, married sisters, befriended the Susun Indians, and had them build La Casa Grande. 1834, 1839, Vallejo builds a log home and corral in Big Valley, just north of where Kelseyville is right now. He ran cattle in the valley with a Mexican mayordomo and 10 pomo vaqueros. The valley was soon overrun with Vallejo's cattle that mostly went wild. In 1842, George Simpson visits General Vallejo and describes his treatment of Indians. About 300 in number are badly clothed, badly lodged, and badly fed. They vegetate rather than live. Meanwhile, the Kelsey brothers have decided to move west. I guess they're getting kicked out of Missouri altogether. Ben, Samuel, David, and Andy Kelsey join the Bidwell Bartleson wagon train to California. Though the Oregon Trail had been established, this was the first overland trip from Independence, Missouri to California directly. Ben is traveling with his wife and child, Sam with his wife and five children, and David is with his wife. At Soda Springs, Sam and David Kelsey and their families leave the Bidwell Bartleson group to head for Oregon on the Oregon Trail. Andy, Ben, and wife Nancy remain with Bidwell to California. At Owl Springs, Ben Kelsey must abandon his wagons as the oxen are too weak from lack of grass. If you've got oxen hauling wagons, you need grass. That's like a gas station every so many miles. But if you look in this photo, you can see there's no gas stations for quite a while. Owl Springs is where they left their uh, wagons. And this was the trail from Owl Springs toward California. After the 170-day trek, the Bidwell party arrived barefoot and hungry 
at the John Marsh Rancho near San Francisco Bay. Ben's wife, Nancy Kelsey, is the first woman to travel overland to California, and she is later credited with sowing the bear flag for the California Bear Revolt. She didn't actually sell, sow it. It was actually sowed by one of her servants, who was a sailor, and being a sailor, he knew how to sew sailcloth, and, uh, but she's credited with having made the flag. Uh, this is where she's buried, in uh, Cuyama Valley. Santa Barbara County. The group had to get passports. They were entering Mexico when they came to California. So they had to get passports from the Mexican government to remain. Initially, Mariano Vallejo refused and 14 of them were jailed until John Marsh vouched for them. In December, the Kelseys traveled with Bidwell up the Sacramento River to Sutter's place. Sutter's treatment, John James Clayman visits Sutter and writes in his diary, 600 to 800 in Indians are in a complete state of slavery. He feeds them from 10 to 15 troughs, three to four feet long like so many pigs. They must eat with their hands. Is, did we learn that in fourth grade with John Sutter and learning? No, I didn't. No. Uh, Back to Vallejo. In 1843, Salvador Vallejo has become the general of the Mexican garrison at Sonoma. He's in need of a large labor force to harvest his wheat and barley crop. Like most Mexican landowners, Salvador <laughs> believes that all Native Americans on his land belong to him, just like the cattle and the trees and the wildlife. So in 1843, he leads a group of 80 ranchers into Lake County to round up Indians to work at the Sonoma Rancho to help him get his crop. They trade with the Koi on Indian Island at the south end of the lake. The Koi chief joins them as an interpreter. The next day, they stop at Rattlesnake Island over in the Oaks to ask the Elim people to come with them to Sonoma. The Elim people were not interested. Finally, they visit the village of Tamdot on Anderson Island, sometimes called Buckingham Island. And when the villagers refused to leave to go to Sonoma, they killed the chief and set the village dance house on fire with most of the villagers inside. This map actually shows their route. We don't know the exact date. We think it's 1843, but a couple of other people have mentioned 42, 41. This is actually from the diary of uh, one of the fellows that was on this expedition. And I'm gonna read, I'm gonna read right from it. When I read this for the first time, it was, it was just amazing. I had no idea this other massacre had taken place. The interpreter was to tell the chief of the rancheria from Captain Vallejo that he wanted to see and talk with him. After about an hour, 30 or more rafts with, the Indian, with an Indian in each came to the shore. They were actually camped, Vallejo's group was camped uh, where Glen Haven is now. Then the Indians surrounded Captain Vallejo, fawning upon him. He told them, by means of the interpreter, that he wanted to put a ranch on his land back there, to which the Indians said, okay. And Vallejo went on to propose to take them to Sonoma to see the place, offering them blankets and whatever he could give them. But the Indians refused. Then Ramon Carrillo told Vallejo to shut them up in the Timescal, the dance house. At the order given, a little more than half of the Indians entered the, the Timescal. The chief of the rancheria came unarmed to Carrillo to ask what the other, that the others might enter. The Indian auxiliaries that came with Vallejo at that time shut the door of the Timescal. Carrillo lancing the chief in the stomach and killing him at once. Then the other Indians took it to the water. The auxiliaries that came with Vallejo 
following them in two of the rafts, killing with bows those defenseless ones who tried to escape by swimming. Then the expedition fired on them, killing some and wounding others. At this time, the auxiliaries who were guarding the entrance to the Temescal made four or five breaches and set fire to the grass there was on the floor. Then the interpreter told them if they would come out, nothing would be done to them. But those who were inside said they would rather die by burning than be taken by the soldiers. And their bodies were heard crackling from outside as they burned. After this deed, cruel as it were, all done by the Christian Indians of Sonoma, Chief Chamaco presented himself to Vallejo, pointing out to him that the smoke which the Indians had made, calling to the other Indians of the islands, who also had already made fires as a signal warning. Vallejo and his group hightailed it out of the Clear Lake Basin, being chased by the Elim people and the Khoi people and all the other tribes that had seen the smoke. Uh, there's no historical marker in Glenhaven um, talking about this particular. You turn that the other way, you can make it back. Oh, thank you. I'm, I'm so high tech, huh? <laughs> yeah. Well, the Kelsey brothers decide here they are in California. They want to go to Oregon to see their, the rest of their family. So Andy, Ben, and Nelson, Nancy travel to Oregon where they meet up with their brothers. They all return to California with a herd of cattle. David settles at French camp. He gets smallpox and dies in 1845. The rest settle in the Napa Valley and become friends with Salvador Vallejo. Ben Kelsey builds a cabin about a mile south of the current location of Calistoga. The next year, Ben and his brothers join John C. Fremont to take over Vallejo's Casa Grande home in Sonoma and declare California's independence from Mexico. After several hours of visiting and drinks, it's decided that the Vallejos should be taken as prisoners to Sutter's Fort, where they are treated like guests. So Vallejo is no longer in command of a garrison of troops, and the bad feelings the Clear Lake have Pomo had for Vallejo, um, he's not really welcome in Lake County anymore. So he wisely decides to move his cattle out of Big Valley into Napa Valley. He tries to sell off his Clear Lake land holdings, and he's hoping that William Boggs might buy the land from him. William Boggs was a uh, governor of Missouri at one time. Boggs wasn't interested. After Vallejo moved his cattle out of the lake basin, Clear Lake's Native American community considered that the wild cattle left behind belonged to them. After the Camdot massacre, no white men want to enter the Clear Lake Basin. Vallejo is happy to sell off his remaining wild stock at Clear Lake to Charles Stone, Mr. Sherlin, and Andy and Ben Kelsey. And the estimates are anywhere from 800 to 15,000 cattle and up to 2,500 horses. He also gives them the right to graze in the valley. Andy Kelsey and Charles Stone move to Big Valley to manage the herd. They have the Indians build them a 15-foot wide, 40-foot long, two-room adobe next to Kelsey Creek along with a large corral. It takes 400 to 500 people working two months to build the adobe and they're allowed to slaughter one steer a day to feed 400 or 500 people. The Native Americans resent the fact that Stone and Kelsey are claiming the Clear Lake cattle. These were the cattle Vallejo had left for them. Stone and Kelsey were even forcing the Pomo Vaqueros to round up the cattle so they could be driven out of the area. It's kind of like, hey, I like your car. Could you drive it over to my house for me? I'm on it. Oopie, wife of Chief Augustine, reports that when Stone and Kelsey first arrived, they were welcomed by the Pomo and relations were pleasant. 
It was then that many of the Pomo moved their homes near the adobe and gave their hunting implements to Stone and Kelsey as they wouldn't need them anymore. Once the Pomo were disarmed, Stone and Kelsey's attitude changed. Outside visitors to the ranch mention in their diaries that Stone and Kelsey would entertain guests by shooting Indians just to see them jump and dance and by lashing them as rec recreation. Oopi was 15 when she and another girl were forced to live with Stone and Kelsey. If a father or mother was asked to bring their daughter to the adobe and didn't obey, they were whipped and hung by the hand. The Pomo working for Stone and Kelsey were given no pay. They were given four cups of wheat a day as a ration. Apparently Vallejo paid them better than that. <clears throat> Both Pomo and white visitors report that the typical punishment for complaining about work or hunting on the ranch was to be whipped or with hands tied, hoisted off the ground by a rope over a tree limb for hours. These things occurred two or three times a week. By the way, I've got references for all of this. That's those little numbers at the end of the sentence. That's the reference that says this. Oopi's nephew asked her for extra wheat for his starving mother. Oopi gave him some, and when Stone found out, he shot the boy. One Indian worker who let a raccoon ruin some of the ranch watermelons was killed for his negligence. In 1848, the mistreated Pomo surrounded the adobe with Stone and Kelsey inside. A friendly Indian traveled to Sonoma and told Ben and Sam Kelsey, who put together a posse of seven, to confront the Pomo. After the posse broke up the siege, the Kelseys organized 144 Big Valley Pomo to fight the Scotts Valley Band suspected of stealing cattle. No Pomo were found in Scotts Valley, but one was found in the Blue Lake Canyon. He was tortured and led the group to the villagers in the hills above Blue Lake. They were rounded up and marched to the Kelsey Ranch as slaves, and their village in Scotts Valley was burned. I've got a map, actually. Anybody can get this map. It's on the web. The Bureau of Land Management has images of all of the original plat maps for the area that go back to the 1850s. <clears throat> And we've got one from this area, and it actually has a depiction of an Indian village on it at that spot in Scotts Valley. In 1848, they took 172 Pomo from Clear Lake to Sonoma for two months to build adobes for Vallejo. Chief Augustine, who was chief of the Big Valley Hulanapo tribe, was also taken but escaped and returned to Clear Lake. As punishment, Stone and Kelsey tied him up in a standing position in a sweat lodge for a week with only bread and water. The gold rush happened. Ben Kelsey took 26 Clear Lake Pomo on a one-month trip to the gold fields on the Feather River. They mined a bag of gold for the Kelseys as large as a man's arm, and all returned safely and were paid a pair of overalls, a hickory shirt, and a handkerchief. Kelsey used the money to buy a thousand head of cattle. Uh, this map actually shows Kelsey's diggings up in the Sierras, just past um, Folsom, Sacramento. In the fall of 1849, with a $12,000 investment by Governor Boggs, Ben Kelsey put together a second gold expedition. He picked 100 Pomo from Big Valley and took them to Sonoma for the expedition. With him were Brother Sam, William Boggs, Salvador Vallejo, and four other whites. This time they also took a herd of sheep. The Pomo were not fed on the trip and two died on the trail. Kelsey decided that it was more profitable to sell his supplies to the miners that were there than to dig for gold himself. So he made $16,000 selling the supplies. Malaria broke out 
Kelsey had to be carried home on a bed. The Pomo were left in the Sierras in Calusa Indian Territory, who were the enemies of the Pomo. Between the malaria and the harsh winter and the enemies, only three Pomo men out of the hundred made it back to Lake County alive. According to Pomo accounts, this is when Stone and Kelsey buy the rest of Vallejo's cattle in the lake basin. The winter of 1849, Stone and Kelsey have decided to march all of the old and non-workable Pomo to Sacramento. So only the strong and young would remain at Clear Lake. To tie the group together for the march, they forced the Pomo to work on making ropes for two weeks. So which one of these things was the last straw? I don't think anybody really knows. It could be any of these three. The plan to drive all the elders and children down to Sacramento, that might have been the last straw. The deaths of the people that were taken to the gold fields. Or two years of starvation, whippings, and torture and abuse. There are several different versions of the Stone and Kelsey killing. <clears throat> Roganall Benson, or William Benson, who was uh, uh, Native American in Big Valley, was not alive at the time, but these stories were handed down to him by his parents. And he describes it this way. Some of the starving families hired Chasis and Chuk to obtain cattle for food. They borrowed Kelsey's horse and rounded up a few head. While trying to rope one of the steers, the cattle and horses got spooked and ran off. Back at Chase's house, the families that hired him recommended that they pay Stone and Kelsey 16,000 beads as payment for the missing horse. No one agreed. It is then suggested that they tell them the horses were stolen. No one agreed. Shuk and Chase's suggest killing Stone and Kelsey. No one agrees. This uh, description of what happened is very much um, goes along with traditional POMO um, politics. If, if you've got an, an idea or if the captain of a village has an idea and presents it to the community as something to do, basically community agreement is required before it happens. And that's what you see going on here. Chase's band is joined by Batus and Kranas. They tell the house servants to take all the weapons out of the house at night. The next morning, as usual, Stone brought a cast iron pot of coals out of the house to light the fire under the large servant's pot of wheat. Five Pomo were waiting outside, and Okanas took Shuk's bow and shot Stone. Stone pulled out the arrow and ran for the house, swinging the cast iron pot, breaking one man's arm. Andrew Kelsey opened the door and was charged. He was stabbed twice in the back, broke loose, and ran for the creek. Chases sought, shot Kelsey in the back with an arrow. Kelsey pulled it out, dove into the creek, and swam across. On the other side, Kelsey saw Ju Lu, who he could trust. He asked Ju Lu to save him, but Ju Lu said, it is too late to save you. I will also be killed. Ju Lu and Big Jim had Kelsey by the arms, weak from blood loss. Big Jim said to Da Pi Tao, his wife, this is the man who killed your son. Here's your chance for revenge. He gave her a spear and she stabbed Kelsey in the heart. Kelsey's body was left there for the coyotes. Meanwhile, back at the adobe, Chasis and Ornas followed Stone's blood trail up the stairs and found him dead in the loft. Version number one. Oopi's version. Now, Oopi was there, obviously, at the time. Later on in life, she was working on one of the ranches in Big Valley. And this is her story as written down by the lady whose ranch she was working at. In preparation for the cattle drive out of the valley, Stone and Kelsey gave Pomo two steers for a feast and a dance. 
Upi and the other girl got permission to attend the dance where they were instructed about the plan. That night, one held the guns out the door of the adobe while the other poured water in the barrels. The next morning, one girl waved a signal from the door of the eating house and a group of Pomo rushed the building. Stone and Kelsey got out of the eating house, but one was knocked down and hit in the head with a rock. The other made it to the adobe, got a rifle, but it wouldn't fire. He was killed in the adobe. Both men were buried in the creek bank. So there's some similarities. There's some differences. Chief Augustine's version, Stone and Kelsey's guns were stolen the night before. The attack happened early in the morning. Though the, through the window, Kelsey was shot in the back with an arrow. He ran out, crossed the creek, and an old Indian struck him in the head with a stone, killing him. Stone ran into a small building to hide. The Indians cut the door fastenings. Door fastenings in those days were just leather straps nailed to the wood. <clears throat> and Stone ran out, waving a large knife to get through the crowd. Someone stepped on his long-tailed coat, tripping him, and he was trampled and his throat cut with his own knife. Though he made it to the adobe, he died in the loft. The Indians buried Kelsey in the creek bank where he fell. Stone was buried near the house. When the soldiers came, they dug up both bodies and buried them together. If you read the 1881 history of Lake County, you get this version. While Stone and Kelsey were out with vaqueros tending cattle for a drive, Oopie poured water in their guns. The next morning at breakfast, the Pomo charged the adobe and killed Kelsey with an arrow. Stone escaped into the loft, jumped out the upper window, and ran to the creek, hiding in a willow thicket. The whole ranch of Pomo searched, found him, and killed him by striking him in the head with a rock. Both men were buried in the sand of the creek bank. Major Ed Sherman has a version. He wasn't even there. <laughs> Stone and Kelsey befriended the Clear Lake Pomo and paid them well for their services as, as vaqueros. The Pomo had ample food and ate at the same table after their employers were done. One morning in 1850, while eating breakfast, Prieto was a chief of the Habinopo, and George treacherously murdered Stone and Kelsey by shooting them with their own rifles. William and Mary Nobles have a version. Their version is that the bodies of Stone and Kelsey were hung in a tree and shot with arrows before being taken town and buried by the soldiers. Okay, I'm an archeologist. I like to do scientific analysis. So you have all of these different versions. So I went through all the versions and took out the things that seem to agree Everyone seemed to agree it was a morning attack. Everyone, not everyone. Most people agree that Kelsey was shot with an arrow. Most people agree that Stone died in the loft. Some people agree that one was hit with a rock. That both were buried. And then things get a little dicey. We only have two accounts where the weapons were taken and the weapons were watered and Kelsey was stabbed and Kelsey swam the creek. Then we only have one account where Stone was shot with an arrow, Stone was stabbed, Stone died outside, both shot with their own rifles. Kelsey left for the coyotes and the bodies were hung and shot with arrows. So <clears throat> as a scientist, I would say those ones that only have a single bar, a single line, uh, I would take with a grain of salt. Um, I mean, we're dealing with accounts that are secondhand, some of them thirdhand, some of them by people who weren't even there. Um, the first one I like, uh, the ones with only two people giving the account, I would say, yeah, maybe, and probably, especially because 
A couple of those accounts were from Upi, the, the wife of the chief of the tribe, who was there in the house at the time. They expected immediate retaliation, but nothing happened. Feeling like free men once more, most of the Native Americans in Lake County returned to their old villages in Scotts Valley and Upper Lake. They placed lookouts at the Lower Lake Trail, the west side of Big Valley, and the Eight Mile Valley Trail from Ukiah. Two to three weeks passed with no whites being seen. Meanwhile, Sam and Bill, Ben Kelsey, down in the Napa Valley, called on the troops and then organized a group of armed settlers who rode off and murdered a large number of Indians in the lower part of the Napa Valley. They asked whites to separate their own Indian slaves from strange Indians, and the strange ones were then brutalized, shot, or burned to death by Kelsey and company. Another party of 40 to 50 armed settlers headed by Samuel Kelsey and a Mormon named Joseph Smith start near Yauntville and burned and killed their way south, pausing long enough in Sonoma to announce that they would hunt and kill every Indian male and female found in the country. They became known as the Sonoma Raiders. Finally, in March 1850, a Napa rancher filed a complaint and the next day, Sam Kelsey and six others were arrested and jailed at Benicia, which was the state capital at the time. Several others were named but not charged, while a third group, including Ben Kelsey, was admitted to bail. The Sonoma Seven were incarcerated on the USS Savannah while their case was argued before the California Supreme Court. This was the very first case ever argued before the California Supreme Court. They had no jails. California was a brand new state. There was no legal system. There was no jails. There, this sailing ship was as close as they could come to being able to incarcerate somebody. You didn't, you thought, didn't think we were going to get to Bloody Island, did you? <clears throat> If you read the 1881 and 1914 county histories, this is how the Bloody Island Massacre is described. General Smith ordered Lieutenant Stoneman to lead a company to punish the Clear Lake Pomo for the Stone and Kelsey deaths. On arriving, they found no Pomo in the area. They exhumed Stone and Kelsey's remains and reburied them together on Panea Hill. So if you're leaving Lower Lake, or, no, if you're leaving Kelseyville and coming towards Lakeport, there's a little hill that you go over. Uh, Bell Hill Road goes off of that, you know, when you're on Highway 29. Actually, Highway 29 was constructed right through Panea Hill and right through where their grave was. They had been moved before then. Finally, at the north end of the lake, they discovered the Indians at a village of Badonapati, on an island surrounded by Tule Marsh. From their shore location, Stoneman's rifles were out of range. So he sent to Benicia for reinforcements. Lieutenant Lyon led two more companies of reinforcements, obtained two whale boats loaded with supplies, strapped to wagon <coughs> running gear, and two mountain howitzers. These were trailed to Lower Lake. By this time, many Napa residents had joined the group and all met at Anderson's Ranch west of Lower Lake. This is, this is not the Anderson's Ranch, which is now the state park. That was much later. This Anderson's Ranch was further west along the lakeshore. Part of the soldiers, cannon and whale boats headed up the lake. Stoneman led the mounted soldiers and volunteers around the west side of the lake. So they came up to Lower Lake over to Anderson's ranch, took the boats up the lake, and uh, the other guys <coughs> rode their horses around the side. Both groups met at Robinson Point, just south of the island, where the Pomo Pumps is. During the night, the volunteers and cannon were put in position north of the island, 
<clears throat> in the morning, a few shots, still falling short, attracted the attention of the villagers. Meanwhile, the boats with soldiers came up on the opposite side of the island. At the signal, the cannon blew canister shot into the village, sending Pomo running south over the island, where a line of soldiers rode up from, rose up from the Thules and dispensed a volley of musket fire. Canister shot are not balls, cannon balls. Canister shot are round discs with all kinds of metal shrapnel in between them that you shove down into the barrel. So it, when it shoots out, that canister of stuff just flies everywhere. It's just shrapnel flying everywhere. As many as could ran into the lake, waded through the Thule and escaped into the hills. The soldiers killed women and children, even following them into the water, shooting, stabbing, and clubbing them with their guns and oars. When finished at the island village, the military traveled up to Potter Valley and then back through the Ukiah Valley where they attacked another village down the Russian River to Sonoma, Santa Rosa, and then to Benicia. The expedition had taken more than a month. Roggenhall Benson's version. William Benson, uh, he was a writer. He and his wife were basket makers. They were very well known by, um, they were very well known by the anthropologists at Berkeley at the time. Uh, there was a lady, a wealthy lady from Southern California who would visit Lake County and hire Jim Benson, I mean, uh, William Benson as her guide to take her around the lake. She would actually take photographs. This is about 1906. She would buy baskets from him and his wife and, uh, and kept diaries of her travels through Lake County. I have a bunch of photographs of hers that were taken in 1906. Is that Grace Nicholson? Grace Nicholson, yeah. The lake watchers saw a boat coming around the point, Buckingham Point. Lookouts posted on Canocti saw boats with red cloth on a pole at the bow and each with 10 to 15 men. Smoke signals were given. Trail watchers on Ash Hill saw the infantry coming around the lake's, lake port side and also sent up signals. The infantry shot off the big guns a few times in Scotts Valley. They ended up camping on Emerson Hill by Upper Lake. The whites took the boats to the island where the Pomo met them in peace, but the whites were determined to kill. Ji Wee Li threw up his hands and said, no harm, me good man. He was shot in the arm and the Pomo next to him was shot dead. Most ran and hid in the Thule's, but four or five fought back and another was shot in the shoulder. Many women and children were killed. One woman reports seeing two white men with guns held in the air with a little girl hanging from their bayonets. They threw her into the water. Two more did the same, this time with a little boy. A wounded mother with a baby were both stabbed and thrown into the lake. It took four to five days to pick up all the dead. It was discovered that all children had been stabbed to death, as were most women. All the dead were burned on the east side of the creek, east of the, of the island. <clears throat> The whites had caught a pomo during the, mar during the march through Scotts Valley. They had hung him in their camp and built a fire under him. Another was tied to a tree and burned to death. The next day, the soldiers marched to Mendocino County and capped, camped on the Ed Howell Ranch. The Indian village there tried to surrender, but were massacred anyway. This is a picture of, of Indian Jim that was taken by Grace Nicholson. And there's the picture actually shows Badanapati, or Bloody Island, in the background. Going through all of these accounts and the background research, I discovered that this man, Indian Jim, back in, that, in the day was called Fisherman Jim. 
And when the Bloody Island Massacre happened, his grandmother strapped him to her back and waited out in the Thule's and hid in the Thule's for two days so that they would not be killed by the, by the military. Here he is in 1906. So that was uh, Benson's account. This is Chief Augustine's version. Soldiers came to Kelsey's ranch and then around the lake by way of Scotts Valley. Here they found an Indian whom they killed. The rest escaped into the brush. They discovered the Indians on an island near Upper Lake. They sent four boats and cannon and went to Lower Lake where they got Indian guides to show them the way to Upper Lake Island. The rest of the soldiers went around the lake by land taking the cannon with them. In Scotts Valley, the Indians had one of Kelsey's rifles and fired it at the soldiers. The soldiers fired their cannon twice into the brush, but did not kill any Indians. The two parties met at the point near Robinson's place. In the morning, the soldiers killed their two Indian guides, one shot and one hung. The party with the cannon went around to the head of the lake, north of the island. Those with the boats went into the slough on the south side. Soldiers began firing their guns and five Indians went out to give battle, one with a sling, the others with bows. The cannon weren't fired at all. The Indians took to the Thule's and water, keeping out of the way of the soldiers. Only 16 were killed. The soldiers then went over to Potter Valley and Yokaya Valley. They had a fight with the Yokayas. The Indians fought well considering their arms, but many were killed, over 100 at least. Binmore drove the rest of Kelsey's cattle out of the valley. Nathaniel Lyon actually is the guy that led this uh, military attack. And in his writings to Major Canby in Monterey from Anderson's Rancho at Lower Lake, he describes the expedition this way. <clears throat> we left Benicia on the 6th, arrived at Anderson's on the 11th. On the 12th, Lieutenant Davidson took the mounted detachment and howitzers around the west side of the lake. We proceeded by water up the lake, arriving in position on the 14th. It took him two days to row up the lake. Davidson's detachment attacked a rancheria in Scotts Valley, killing four and taking the chief. Early on the morning of the 15th, the landing on the island was affected under strong opposition from the Indians, who took flight in every direction, plunging into the water among the heavy growth of Thule that surrounds the island. I saw all, no alternative but to pursue them into the Thule with most gratifying results. The number killed, not less than 60, and doubt little extended to 100 and upwards. The Indians were supposed to number about 400. No injury to the command occurred. The village was burned along with a large amount of stores. Being satisfied that the tribes of the Russian River had participated in the murders of Stone and Kelsey and were harboring tribes known to be the most guilty, I proceeded to the headwaters Potter Valley seeking the village of Chief Chapo. Finding the village deserted, we proceeded 22 miles downriver to a tribe called Yochayahach, among who was Priato and his tribe. He was the chief of the Habinapo. The morning of the 19th, we had them completely surrounded on an island in the river that became a perfect slaughter pen. The number killed, not less than 75, and probably double that. During our passage downriver, an Indian was taken captive who communicated that some Spanish citizens has instigated the Indians against the Americans, confirming hints previously thrown out to me by several persons. These Spaniards were on the road to Sonoma. I detached Lieutenant Davidson to Sonoma to obtain the information. Leaving the Russian River, I proceeded across the mountains and arrived at this place, Anderson's Ranch, after two days' march. Major Ed Sherman, we heard of him before, I think. <clears throat> Lyon's attack on the island of 400 warriors was good strategy and courage. Many squaws and children jumped into the lake and drowned. 
Other women and children committed suicide in fear while the soldiers fought with the bucks and burned the village. At least 400 warriors were killed. Another 400 squaws and children died by drowning or suicide. Then the company crossed to the Russian River where another hostile tribe of the same size was encountered and wiped out of existence. Ed Sherman, quite a guy. Um, here's a graph of the Bloody Island Massacre based on those people that had comments. Um, I gave a little more weight to Chief Augustine's account and a little more weight to Captain Lyon's account because they were both there. Um, so villagers ran into the lake? Yeah, I think so. The Yokaya village fight absolutely happened. A lion came from Benicia, two boats and two cannons. They met at Anderson's. The cannon went with the mounted soldiers by land around the lake. Now, one of those guys says they went in the boats. They attacked the island in the morning. I, I tend to believe all of these, except for the last four or five, I think. Um, women and children were killed. Stoneman. Uh, let's see. Cannon were fired in Scotts Valley. They met at Robinson's. Soldiers killed Native American guides, yep. The cannon and the volunteers north of the island and the boats from the south Boats met strong opposition, maybe, I don't know. The village was burned, probably was, they usually did that. Women and children committed suicide? I don't think so. Um, the boats met in peace? Nah. So I think those last three are definitely out. And probably half of the ones that have three mentions are, are probably not true also. The ones on the left with the most mentions I think we can take as uh, things that really happened. But, you know, that's, that's how a scientist looks at this stuff. You guys want to stand and stretch for a minute? No? Okay, good. <laughs> what happened to Sam and Ben Kelsey? Well, in its first ever decision, the California Supreme Court released the Sonoma 7 on $10,000 bond. They were charged with arson and murder. There was a problem. California was not yet really a state. There were no jails, the legal system, or clearly defined laws. They were to appear in Sonoma District Court and stand trial for murder. But two days after their release, a news article appeared for Trinity Bay, the fast sailing schooner Ryerson. At least three of the Sonoma Seven jumped bail and boarded the Ryerson for Trinity Bay. Upon arriving at the newly discovered Humboldt Bay, the group formed the Union Company, established a town called Union, which later became Arcata. 10 of the 33 members of the Union Company had been implicated in the Sonoma-Napa Indian attacks, including Joseph Smith and Sam Kelsey's father-in-law. They started claiming ownership of land up and down the east coast of Humboldt Bay. Same stuff they were doing in Missouri. Within a year of their arrival, they had murdered seven Indians and burned two Wiat villages. In 1850, Ben Kelsey sold the Clear Lake stock and received $13,000 down, but the buyer never paid the balance. Ben and his wife, Nancy, and Sam traveled to Humboldt Bay overland. On the trip, Ben killed a tribal chief. Though they had impressive holdings and built fancy homes on Humboldt Bay, both Sam and Bill, Ben defaulted on their loans and lost their Arcata land. Sam moved to San Bernardino County in 1861 and formed a band of Confederate sympathizers. A warrant was issued for his arrest in 1862 and he disappeared from the historical record. 
Ben and Nancy moved to Mexico in 1859 and then to Texas. In 1861, while Ben was out hunting, Nancy, a neighbor woman, and their children were raided by Comanche. Though all were hiding, the Indians managed to find and scalp the 12-year-old Kelsey girl. She survived, but was considered deranged. They moved back to California where Ben died in 1888 and Nancy Kelsey died in 1896. It turns out that in the 1850s, some teenagers decided to loot uh, Stone and Kelsey's graves. On, huh? You said 1850s. Oh, sorry, 1950s. To, to loot, dig up Stone and Kelsey's graves to see are they really in there. And, uh, and these kids actually found them. And a, a neighbor uh, discovered this, and to put them to shame, they forced the boys to carry the bones in the Kelseyville parade so that all the townsfolk could, you know, make fun of them. It was after that that uh, it was decided that a, a historical marker should be made. And Henry Malden, county historian, Bert Smith, uh, had originally, they'd been buried in a four foot, they, they reburied them. And then they decided, nah, let's, let's dig them up and put them in a safe place. So you probably recognize this monument was put in in the 1950s. And underneath that obsidian monument are actually the remains of Stone and Kelsey. This monument is nowhere near where their original house was. Their house was north of Kelseyville. This is actually southwest <clears throat> of Kelseyville. Bancroft writes, the Kelseys were rough men often in trouble with the law. Kelsey and Stone were men who could never use conciliatory methods with engines and such varmint, and they were both killed as they well deserved to be. That is all I could find. I'm sure there are other stories handed down uh, through families, probably Native American families in the community, other than the ones that I have here. Um, but that, this is all that's been published that I could find on these events in Lake County. Um, how many of you had heard of the Camdot massacre? About three people in the back. Yeah. Now, well, I know you have. <laughs> she wrote a book on the Native Americans of Lake County. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, and that was uh, at least as atrocious as the Bloody Island massacre. Um, so, uh, you know, it's an amazing part of this county's history. Uh, history isn't always fun. It's not always happy. It's not always what you want it to be. But it's there. And it's something we need to all know about, I think, to be able to appreciate everyone's view of the world and everyone's place in the world and uh, just to be able to be accepting of our neighbors and friends. And it'd be nice if, if we had some eyewitnesses that we could interview, but we don't. You know, so this is the best we can do. Um, there are a lot of similarities, uh, but we'll never really know exactly what happened. Those, those people are all gone. And, Thank you so much for coming. Um, I, by doing the work that I do with the tribes around the lake, I've, over the years I've, I have a, a, an amazing um, respect for the, for the Pomo people of Lake County because of stuff like this and all the shit that's happened over the last 200 years. Uh, and yeah, still here still practicing traditional ceremony, still having traditional life ways, still being part of the community and, and uh, a vibrant part of the community. And I think the more, well, we've got two supervisors now that are Native American, so yeah.
I've been doing uh, archaeology in Lake County for 50 years, and when I first started, well, <laughs> I vacationed in Lake County since I was a kid. I learned how to swim in Blue Lake, actually. So when I first started doing archaeology here and getting to know the Native American culture, um, the Bloody Island Massacre was always something that would come up. And, and there were so many different versions and nobody seemed to know exactly what happened. Uh, and so after a few years, I thought, you know what? I need to know what happened just for my own personal benefit so that when I work with Native American communities studying their prehistory, I have a better grasp of that particular subject. So I started doing some background research and discovered that there were so many versions of the Bloody Island Massacre. Of course, there was no one left that had witnessed it. Uh, so these were all stories that were handed down generation to generation, either through uh, historians or family members or ranch, ranch people around here or the Native American community, occasionally they would be written down, but not all of them. So, it's, uh, so I just started digging through them and I uncovered a lot more than the Kelsey killings and the Bloody Island Massacre. The Bloody Island Massacre was not the only massacre in Lake County. Uh, there was one in 1843. Salvador Vallejo came up and burned a village down with most of the most of the villagers in the dance house. Uh, so that was it. It really gives you a perspective of what life was like back in the early 1800s, mid 1800s. So yeah, it was uh, it was something that I needed to know for myself. And after putting this together, I thought, you know, I think the general public needs this information. You know, it's not a happy time in Lake County's past, but it is history and it's part of our past. And I think uh, the public deserves to know.